Welcome to the Elevate Podcast, conversations with women changing the face of business. And now your hosts, Christy Wallace and Maricela Herrera. Hello and welcome to the Elevate Podcast. This is your host, Christy Wallace, with my co-host, Maricela Herrera. Hi, Maricela. How are you doing? Uh, I'm tired. I didn't really sleep well last night. I don't know. I don't know how you're feeling, but I've been reading quite a few articles about how everyone's hitting a wall, and I can say wall has been hit. <laughs> yeah. You know, I've been having a lot of conversations uh, to a similar effect. Uh, many of us are, are just feeling a bit overwhelmed or just, you know, a year plus into this pandemic and the world we've been in, uh, the impacts of that, of working from home being isolated, of caregiving. There's, you know, so many layers to all of that. I'll say me personally, you know, and this may change tomorrow, so don't hold me to it, but um, I had felt that way a few weeks ago. And right now I'm, I'm feeling good. I don't know if it's the change in weather or um, just some of our recent conversations, Maricela, and conversations with the team about the exciting work we're doing. It feels a little bit easier to look towards the future now uh, than it had been over the past couple months. And Mm -hmm. that gets me excited about where we're going. But I I hear you. It has definitely been rough. Yeah. I'm also just tired. As you know, I've had uh, a house guest for the past two weeks um, with my father basically showing up unannounced. (laughs) Um, So I'm, I'm, I'm honestly just tired. Yes. And for our listeners who may not Uh, be familiar with New York City living. Having guests can be uh, quite an experience and intimacy and uh, (laughs) carving out small spaces. Oh, yeah. You have to get creative. (laughs) Well, he is, he, it's, you know, cherish the time and uh, he will be leaving soon and you'll get your place back. So, and it's always, I mean, it is, I'm saying that just, I'm being a brat. I'm just, like I said, tired, but it's now it's nice to see my family, like my father and I haven't seen my family in two years. So, you know, it's all okay. Yeah, it's all okay. And my guest today, Farnoosh Tarabi, is saying something similar. She's focused on finance. She's written a number of books aimed at millennials around, you know, her aha moment when she was in college that was spurred actually by her parents and how she was raised, but wanting to help people get comfortable with finance, to learn more, to take control of their finances. She's doing some fantastic work, and we'll get to my conversation with Farnoosh. This episode is sponsored by the Cornell S.C. Johnson College of Business. The Cornell Executive MBA Americas program is designed for goal achievers from any industry. Advance your career without interruption, gain global business and leadership perspective, and broaden your professional network as you connect both virtually and in person with faculty and classmates. Achieve your goals with the Cornell Executive MBA Americas program on the weekend and in a city near you. Farnoosh, thank you so much for joining us today on the Elevate podcast. It is such an honor to have you here. I've been a great admirer of yours for quite some time, and I am thrilled that you'll be joining us today. Well, thanks, Christy. It's great to join you. I'm asking if you could please share a little bit about your story to help acquaint the audience uh, with the work that you do and where you are today. Sure. So I've been working in the personal finance space for all of my career, which is now all about 20 years. And I had the great fortune of discovering my passion for personal finance at a pretty early stage. So I would say within the first few years of college, I started to really identify with finance and the storytelling of business and you know, I, I was really fascinated by first just like how the business world works and the stock market and, uh, you know, CEO leadership. And then that kind of trickled down to everyday people and the impact that the financial world has on individuals. And so 
by about my early 20s, I really started to dedicate more of my attention to how to help people and how to educate myself to help people with their personal finances. And so I graduated with a degree in finance from Penn State, but then I quickly married that with a master's in journalism from Columbia. And right out of school, right out of graduate school, I started working in financial media. So uh, first in print as a money magazine reporter assistant, and then into television, still always kind of covering the business world and the personal finance space. But then I did it in television and then I moved into digital. So years into my career in my 20s, I started working at thestreet.com, which for those of you who uh, may not know, it's this wonderful website that covers Wall Street and the financial markets. And it's co-founded by Jim Cramer, who's the host of Mad Money. And that was a huge uh, learning stepping stone for me, um, just learning how to like talk the talk and the lingo of Wall Street and interviewing high profile CEOs and really bringing again that down to Main Street and why it matters for everyday people. And along the way, I got laid off <laughs> as sometimes that happens. And it, but I think like a lot of layoff stories, you look back and think, oh, that was the the beginning of the rest of my life. And it really was for me this intersection I got to. And it was like, do I continue to go th- into deeper into the news world as a journalist? Or do I go the other direction, which is to take everything that I've learned and all the ways that I've been telling stories from television to print to, you know, I, I, I'd even dabbled in podcasts in 2007. So uh, I was familiar with all these different platforms, do I want to go the entrepreneurial route and try to stitch together my own income streams and start a business as a financial reporter, but really an entrepreneur? And I chose the latter and I'm so grateful that I did. It was during the Great Recession of 2009. So lots of uncertainty, but of course, again, in hindsight, great time to step into entrepreneurship. And, and I guess, you know, that's the really the, the, the next chapter the, the, as if there was a book like that would that would be like sort of the current chapter that I'm in still 10 years later working for myself. And the beauty of it is that for me, at least, because I'm someone who really loves to uh, try a lot of different things. I, I don't want to kind of be bogged down in one role all the time. I like to challenge myself and experiment with different ways of storytelling and and advice giving. So throughout the last decade, I've written books. I've done tons of speaking engagements. I've worked in television as a host. I have a podcast now, which is really the centerpiece of my business called So Money. And the the podcast also breeds a lot of other work. So, you know, um, whether that's speaking engagements, brand partnerships. And so, you know, my job really has been to continue to innovate and think a few steps ahead. Um, as a business owner, you, you really, that's that's the exciting slash scary part of it all is like no one is giving you anything. Like there's no deadlines other than the ones that you create and there are no goals other than the ones that you create, which uh, is very liberating in some ways, but also uh, a little anxiety producing, to be honest. Um, but that nevertheless, it's, it's uh, I, I wouldn't trade it in and and so that's really, you know, my story in a nutshell. I, I have so many questions. Um, <laughs> because I love your story. I think it's it's really interesting, the twists and the turns and uh, the direction that it took. And, and I'm going to break it down in a few different places, but then also tap into your expertise. I, I'm, I'm very blown away with your financial acumen as a college student. Um, I... <laughs> was probably at the same time right down the road at Villanova. And mm-hmm. I'll say that I, I don't know. I mean, I, I would say growing up, my my dad, he was one of those people, you know, he didn't want debt. He wanted to, you know, save up money and then pay for things in cash. He had, you know, just, it, it was, um, you know, central to, to him. He just, you know, worked, he didn't get anything unless he could afford it basically. And when I was young, he, he's a dentist. So I worked in his dental office and he opened up a mutual fund account for me at the time when I had no idea what that even meant. Um, but I appreciate it because it, it instilled in me, you know, just this concept of, you know, saving money and, and don't, you know, spend more than, than you have, which served me well, in college and then, you know, the financial situation when, when you're leaving college. 
Um, but I, I suspect, and from what I've heard, um, many of us, you know, don't really start on that journey with, I mean, the means or, or the insights and knowledge uh, around finances at that age. And do you have specific advice now that you give to college students and to that demographic to best set themselves up for financial success during that time? Yes. In fact, in the beginning of my career, I would do a lot of college touring and and talk to college students to this day, you know, not excluding the last year because we've all been in lockdown, but I try to go to my alma maters and and really, you know, have some FaceTime with, with young adults. It's really important that they get this information. I wish, I mean, I didn't really have someone coming to my school talking about money. I was fortunate that my parents briefed me on a few important things. And I, I had an innate curiosity and fluency, I guess, that I wasn't afraid of it or intimidated by it. I knew that I, there was a lot that I didn't know, but I also knew like all I had to do was ask questions or research it and I could get the answers. And that's really the first message that I want to give college students is that a lot, a lot of times money is branded as this really difficult, challenging department that it's and for women too, we often get we're we're told this falsehood that it's a male dominated and kind of male oriented field. It's not feminine, and so for whatever reason, we there's this emotional barrier. You know, like whether it's the fear or the intimidation factor, we don't really get close to it, and we separate ourselves. We kind of silo our financial lives from our regular lives. But what I really want to tell young people as soon as possible is that your financial life is married to your personal life, that your financial decisions are really life decisions. And you need to feel like you have a stake in that. You deserve to have a stake in that. Otherwise, the world can be a scary place and it can be a very, it can take it, otherwise not having that knowledge, you can be taken advantage of, um, in other words, you know, or you'll make mistakes that, that are really avoidable. Um, So first, it's really about giving them the permission to say like this is important and I I can care about this and and not feel selfish or greedy or you know whatever the whatever we want to how we are we've been characterizing money and thinking about money um, that this is really important it's as important as you know knowing what you put in your body and the health that the health steps that we take right the health measures that we take to exercise and eat well and visit our doctors your financial health is uh, is just as important because money is whether you like it or not important you know some people don't want to believe that money matters because they again have been sold this story about money that you know gosh, where do we even begin, right? Like all you have to do is turn on the television. And when we, when rich, quote unquote, I'm using air quotes, rich people are depicted on television, we often use adjectives like greedy or, you know, selfish, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's sort of been characterized as this sort of, you know, not a virtue, like it's not virtuous to be mindful and thoughtful about your money. And I want to be the one to say like, actually, it's a mistake if it's it's to your detriment if you don't care about this. And I know that where no one's expecting you to have all the answers, not even close. I'm still learning. But at the minimum, you what you should have, what you deserve to have is a curiosity that doesn't get squashed, a curiosity that people um, fuel. So when you go and ask someone a question that is an expert, they will give you the answer because it's your right. Or when you go online and you search for answers, um, they're there and, and, you know, there is access to this information often at your fingertips. So have the sort of emotional wherewithal is number one to say like, I can do this. I deserve to know about this. It's important. And I'm not, I'm not expected to have all the answers, but the answers are out there. So at this stage, like if you're 21 in college, I assume you're very good at Googling, (laughs) researching, you know, so a lot of times if you have questions about definitions of things or what things are, it's out there. There is no shortage of information, unlike I think previous generations where it was a much more gated thing where if you wanted to learn about investing, you know, maybe you did have to go work with a financial advisor and pay this person lots of money, but now you can go online and start an account for yourself with paying very little fees and get on a 
journey to financial freedom independently. And that's a beautiful thing. And that's something that I also want to tell college students that the resources are out there. Um, So stay curious, stay true to what your goals are and understand that your money can support your goals and know that, you know, the answers are out there and we're, you're going to make mistakes. I made plenty of them, but it's better to make those mistakes early on and move on quickly so that it, you know, you're not making the big costlier mistakes when they can really leave an impact, like let's say in your thirties or forties. And you can go on Reddit and get all kinds of tips. (laughs) Well, I wouldn't do that. (laughs) No. Uh, You know, social media in general, and I'm, is not like the first place I'd go for financial advice. You know, I think Twitter with its limited characters and Reddit uh, with its hyper escalated emotional charged advice um, or, or TikTok where there's a lot of bad advice on TikTok. I think you have to really try understand your source. Um, but certainly there is value, I think, in the fact that people are even making t- financial TikToks. You know, I think that's cool. Ultimately, I think that what it is, is it's raising the awareness level and it's making money cool. And perhaps for the person who thought it was something that was intimidating or not relevant to their generation, Social media is, I think, helping in that sense, but you do really need to be careful about who you're following and the advice you're getting on on Instagram or Twitter. And I'm on Instagram and I use it a lot to talk about money, but it's for me, it's not, you know, you can't really go that deep on social media. Thank you for that advice. Uh, And and I agree. I mean, there's so much information out there. I remember when I first graduated from school, I was an English and sociology major who went into investment banking. And my dad uh, showed up at, with all of these Warren Buffett books, you know, and he was like, okay, like read up, you're going to like read up. But there's, there's a ton of information out there now. And, and it's exciting. You know, it's, it's you know, tapping into financial knowledge uh, is, you know, can lead to so many other things as our life progresses and we talk about equal pay and we talk about entrepreneurship and Farnoosh you you mentioned you know being an entrepreneur and you know that is I think convoluted or or some mixed messages when it ties to money um, because we know that oftentimes being an entrepreneur is maxing out credit cards or taking a lot of risks but then there's also the upside financially and and you know of course with your dreams and your goals and your aspirations and your achievements but what was as you approached the this point in in your career where you were going out um on your own and and really taking your career into your hands did you have any trepidation when it came to the risks yeah and you know that one of the first things i thought about was like but what's going to happen you know to my healthcare and what's going to happen to my 401k and what about the office supply closet that I had the luxury of of frequenting and all the free markers and post-it notes, you know, like the little things were um, sometimes the things that I would obsess over. But ultimately what helped me navigate the financial risks and certainly, you know, not to discount that not having a 401k or not having employer-sponsored healthcare and all that, 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 that is a hurdle, you know, still, unfortunately. Um, and it can be more expensive for some people to, uh, participate in those types of benefits on their own, create, like basically recreate those benefits for yourself, but it can be done. A lot of people are doing it. It is just one of those things that requires getting familiar with what your options are. It's really just a learning curve. And then you learn, oh, okay, I have, I can open up a SEP IRA. I can, you know, do uh, this sort of health plan, or I can go on my husband's or my spouse's health insurance. Oh, great. Or I could do COBRA, stretch that out for as long as I, I can to buy me some time to sort of shop around and find more affordable health insurance. And so don't let that be the reason you don't pursue your entrepreneurial dreams because there are options. It's just like we don't know what they are, so that scares us, and we, we just assume that the, the options are slim. Not true. But every entrepreneur I have interviewed who's ultimately been successful, and I also a similar story, is you are best having some 
I would say, runway of a year in the beginning to help you uh, acclimate to entrepreneurship in such a way where you're not coming from a place of scarcity and you can make decisions with much more thought and proactiveness. And so let's just like bring this down to earth. Like I left my job, well, I should say they laid me off, right? Um, and I had about a year's worth of money banked in my savings account so I could continue to pay my housing payments, feed myself, all of the necessities I estimated for the next 12 months. And you know what? That bought me so much time. It reduced so much stress because too often when we don't have that luxury of savings, we make knee-jerk, emotionally charged decisions that aren't necessarily in our best interest, but in the moment we feel like we have no other choices. We have to like take that job even though we really don't like it, but it's paying the bills. And you know, that's not that's not an ideal way to live. And so the work is really having that runway. And I it sounds basic, like, oh, of course you need savings. But so often we think that we have to cash out our 401ks and take out credit card debt and live in our cars. Those are the glorified stories we read in the media. You know, so-and-so entrepreneur, millionaire today, lived in his car in the beginning. That's an outlier of a story, which is why it makes the news. But most entrepreneurs I at least have spoken to do it the boring way. They save and then they quit their jobs or then they, you know, go full-time entrepreneur. Uh, it's much more calculated. It's much more conservative. It, it, it is so nuanced. And, you know, when we hear about being that entrepreneur, I... Oftentimes the conversation is just around, you know, yeah, like taking that leap and, and it's, it's so tricky, but there's, you know, so many factors to consider as you're talking about here. You mentioned in your introduction about your, you know, thought leadership and speaking. I know you've written a number of books and it's something when I speak with women, particularly women in the workplace, that's what, what they aspire to be. You know, how do I have my brand? How do I take ownership of my thought leadership and, and really develop that persona. How, what was that process like for you? I mean, obviously being in journalism and media, you kind of had a natural entry point for that, but do you have insights for our community on how they might get started Mm -hmm. on their brand? I think it's really important to first understand what makes you different and what are the things that you're willing to say that your peers in this space are not. What is the void that you're trying to fill? I will give you an example with my last book, When She Makes More, which is all about supporting breadwinning women and their partners through this very still like unorthodox financial arrangement, which is the wife earning more than the husband. Although it's becoming more of the norm, it's still not, quote unquote, socially accepted and you know, I referenced things like a Pew study recently that found that more Americans, men and women, think that it is still a man's responsibility and role to be the financial provider in a in a relationship and in the household. And we don't really have that uh, expectation from women. And so this was a conversation that I felt we weren't having enough of. It was a very personal thing to me too. And that's the other thing that I will tell people is when you're trying to sort of identify your personal brand and thought leadership is also like, what is it that is very close in your life that you can speak about not just from expertise, but personal experience? Because I think these days, especially we're looking for thought leadership that is not just like the PhD, but someone who's lived it. The lived experience is incredibly valuable and really an important part of the narrative these days. I think as it's always been, but especially these days. Um, And so back to the, you know, the breadwinner example, as I was thinking about, you know, what do I want to write about? Where can I go with my passion for helping women and money? Look, there have been a lot of books written about women and money. And this was, you know, many years ago. And there were a lot of books then, you know, on the shelves at the bookstores about financial empowerment for women. And so I thought, well, you know, I don't think this is, I don't think we've said everything. I think, you know, certainly there's there's more to offer in this space. But what is going to be my contribution that will be different or will move the needle? We'll take the conversation somewhere where it hasn't gone before but is still provocative and is still relevant and is still really important for women to hear. And I thought, 
okay, what's happening in my life that I feel is almost, even for me, hard to talk about as it pertains to money? Is there something that even I, as the quote unquote expert in this field, is like, I don't know, is just, it kind of makes me tick? And it was this, it was that I was living in a marriage and I was in a relationship where I made more. And although in our relationship, it didn't quite phase us, um, it it did, I personally felt very much like, mm, I don't know, put on the spot for it. And it was uncomfortable to talk about it with my parents. And I also felt that society at large just like didn't know what to do with me. They're like, oh, my friends, you know, they were like, None of my friends were living this experience. And so I didn't really have anyone to talk to about it. I didn't feel like really safe talking about it with anybody. And so I thought, well, there's an idea. I can't be the only one. And so that's part of, that's been my process at least is, you know, identifying with what's going on in my life that might, that might be relevant to others. And really at this point, there's been so much that's been said there's really not like a new, new idea, uh, but it is what well, can make something fresh and new and different is your take on it, is your perspective. You know, not, not, there's nothing new about money. There's nothing new about women, but what is it about women and money, if we're talk, taking that example, that you think is something that is an idea that's not really explored yet? And, and so that's part of it. And then along the way, you know, getting amplification of that idea is important. So I wrote a book about it, which then, you know, got lots of media attention, but you don't have to do a book. You could do a TED talk. You could start doing a a speaking series. You could do like a really um, deep dive blog post on Medium that, you know, or LinkedIn that takes off and then that maybe that becomes a book. So figuring out what is the platform on which you want to share this idea. Maybe it's a YouTube channel, maybe it's Instagram, and it doesn't have to be a single place, but you got to start somewhere. And the, the key to that, figuring out where to start, is knowing where your audience hangs out mostly. And depending on the tone of this idea and the accessibility of this idea, does it make more sense to do it in video format or a print long form written format? So there's a lot of considerations, but these are just hopefully some questions that as you're listening can get the wheels turning. Media also helps, obviously media attention, and that's something that I have been lucky to, I started my career in the media, so I really understand how to, how to communicate with media, to how to pitch ideas so that I I know that the editor who's reading it will really want that idea, will really want to bring that idea to the masses. And that's something that can also be learned. And it's not where you have to go hire a publicist for $8,000 a month, but something that you can really eventually, I think, understand, um, see the patterns and what editors are looking for and how to present an idea that is really media exciting. I, I hear these themes you're talking about, uh, you know, learning about finance and there's resources out there and learning about, you know, how to pitch your, your idea and learning. I mean, are you just a incredibly curious person? Do you personally love mm-hmm. learning and, and, you know, just that ongoing education? Yeah. And I think more than learning, I love helping. I, I have to learn so that I can help, but it's really a means to an end. You know, learning is a means to an end so that I can then be in service of people. I think that's why I got into journalism. The ultimate, you know, one of the ultimate ways to be in service to a society is to inform and help them make better decisions. And that for me, I think has been always the drive. Even if you th- look back at when I was a little girl, I, when someone would ask me like, what do you want to be when you grow up? the theme was always helping people. So maybe I didn't know that I could do what I'm doing, obviously at age 10, but I would say something like, I want to, you know, I want to be a waitress <laughs> because I love like literally like taking people's orders and delivering what they want. And then I wanted to be a nurse. And then I wanted, I thought maybe I would be a lawyer, always like defending people, helping people. And so I don't think it's, uh, I wasn't too far off, you know? And I think that marrying the journalism with the money stuff is also the ultimate because I can't think of very few, there are very few things like money that um, are as important. And I know maybe that sounds weird to people, but you know, your health, your financial health, your physical health, your mental health, your financial health, 
these things, you know, it's sort of this trifecta and I, I've never met somebody who is like, you know, I like being poor, you know, it's not, no one goes around feeling that every, and, and I do think money can support happiness and gratification in your life. So if I can be helpful to getting people uh, to come to terms with that, but also earn that money and learn how to allocate it wisely for themselves, I think that's a great, it's a great way to spend your life. You, it's, you remind me so much of my sister. I have a twin sister and she's a, an <laughs> educator, but uh, yeah, she just, you know, that's her passion is just helping other people. And that's really inspiring. I, I think as we talk about helping others and, and that type of passion and compassion, it would be remiss not to talk about what is happening in our world today, uh, particularly as we look at the SHU session and women losing their jobs or opting out of the, the workplace because, you know, of the times we're living in and, and the increased responsibilities. I mean, you wrote a whole book on breadwinning women, but the the dynamics within the workplace, I mean, the dynamics within the home have been front and center during the past year. And that has an economic impact, of course. What are, what are your thoughts on, you know, where we can go uh, moving forward? Uh, so what should women be thinking about? Um, and I know that that is a big question, right? Because, um, you know, there's been some who have been able to save money during this time because, you know, we're not going out, we're not traveling. Others who are furloughed or lost their, their jobs. And so it, it's, I think, a time of, of great turmoil for many. And I'd be interested in what advice you might have for people. Yeah. You know, you ask, you know, what, what can women be thinking about? I want men to also be thinking. I want government to also be thinking. I want companies to also be thinking because I think we have for too long made this movement about a woman's right and a woman's movement. And it's like much bigger than that. I think that the pandemic really made that obvious that when women are forced out of the workforce because we don't really give them any other choice when 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 faced with the choice not really it's like when faced with the duties of taking care of your family and working in a pandemic a lot of women had to choose quitting their jobs it was not something they wanted to do it was just that they were not left with options and that is a that is a that is the fault i think of you know society our systems our politics and very little advocacy for women frankly in in so far as being able to make sure that they can they can work and have families like a society with women who aren't working is is that de- it's not just detrimental i mean it's the end of society and so i think that we need to rebrand this as a global crisis um, and it's not about women putting their heads together anymore. We've been putting our heads together for a very long time. We know all the things that we need. We need other people to recognize that and be as much of a stakeholder in this movement. You know, so I just got interviewed by Good Morning America about this. And they were like, you know, I was loving their angle because they were like, we want to give men advice this year as equal pay day has come and gone. You know, we want to give advice to men like because they are such an important player in this movement. And I mean, I think about, for example, the LGBTQ community and gay rights in this country. I feel like when we really turned the corner, turned the dial and got legislation passed for you know, marriage equality, I think it was when we started to, when the dialogue and the conversations began to shift away from it being an exclusive issue concerning gay communities. Like everyone has a gay member in their family or a loved one or is gay, you know, so this is not, this is so far reaching and it became not just a gay rights issue. It became a, 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 a civil rights issue. It became a marriage issue, a marriage equality issue. And I think when you can expand the conversation and the movement so that everybody feels like they have a stake in this is when we can really begin to turn the corner. Um, because it, this is a very big fight. It's a very big movement and we cannot limit it to just the women to come up with the the desires and the solutions. I mean, we, we've been 
screaming it at the top of the hills for years, you know, but I really do hope, I do think that this last year has been an awakening for companies and households and dads and men to be like, yeah, uh, we have been underestimating the importance of women in the world and we need to come up with better better legislation, better systems, better governance, all of it to be able to protect a woman's, not just her pay equity, but like her ability to earn. That's a, that's where we are. That's where we are right now. Equal pay day um, is usually just a day to sort of remind everybody that there is this pay inequity, which is important that we address that. But it's given everything that's happened in the last year with the several steps backwards that women have been forced to take when it comes to their financial livelihood. It's not just about pay equity. It's at this point, it's about just having the opportunity to work, to earn the money. And once you get there, maybe you're still not making as much as the men, but can we also just get women to work? Can we support them at least on that front? And so I think we have a lot of work. We have, you know, When I wrote the book, When She Makes More, and it came out in 2014, it felt like we had all this positive momentum. It's why we got to a point where I could write a book about female breadwinners, where one in five, one in four households had a female leading the financial decision-making and earning in the house. And that was a result of more women going to college and grad school and getting hired and all the good things. And now I worry about that. I feel like we uh, have taken some steps in the opposite direction. but perhaps the silver lining to it is that we all experienced the detriment that comes with women being forced to choose uh, one or the other. Like we, you couldn't have it all in this pandemic. And not to say that when the pandemic's over, we can just go back to having it all. Like we still can't, you know, uh, their, their fractures have been completely exposed and we need, we have a lot of work ahead of us. So well said. Uh, we do have a lot of work ahead of us, but I'm I'm hopeful. You know, maybe I, I just need some hope to to be able to get through these times. But I, I yes. want to believe that you know we've been able to break down many of the systems and structures that don't work for this society uh, or shine a spotlight on those. I agree with you that um, there needs to be concerted effort across you know, legislation and business and, you know, where do we go from here? But um, central to that is is the community and, you know, how that community supports the individual and the individual that's been impacted during this time. And um, everything that you are saying to me resonates and drives home the need for us to, you know, educate, get educated, learn about money and finances, support one another be aware of the role that all of us can play and not just women, but, but allies and advocates. Uh, It's going to take a concerted and communal effort. And, uh, but I'm hopeful that we can do it. I am too. I am too. I think the more we have these types of conversations, we elevate the discourse. We um, just have to keep carrying on and I am hopeful. Parnish, I wanted to end on um, a little bit of a lighter note, which uh, feels odd given the, how important this conversation is, but uh, it's a good way to get to know you a little bit better. So I'm going to ask you some questions if you could just answer in a word or two. Uh, are you an introvert or an extrovert? Hmm. Ooh, I'm, I am an extrovert. What is your favorite day of the week? Uh, Thursday. Are you an (laughs) early bird or a night owl? Night owl. Who would be your dream dinner guest? Dream dinner guest. Um, Oh my gosh. Um, That's so hard. Um, I don't know. I have so many dream dinner guests and I don't want to sound cliche, but I guess it would be, oh, can I, can it be someone I bring back from the dead? Yes, of course. Uh, (laughs) It would be Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Uh, Yes. Yeah. Well, she just celebrated her birthday recently. So Mm. she had some birthday drinks or does she like, 
She has a special. I don't know. We'll find out at the party. We'll what, I'll make her whatever she wants. At the dinner. <laughs> uh, any pet peeves? Pet peeves are when, and this I think can help your audience or be maybe your audience can relate to this is when I love mentoring everybody, especially women and women of color. I uh, think that sometimes in we like as the mentee, we don't do enough of our own research and digging around. And we come to the mentor with like all these questions that I kind of feel like is not a good use of my time because like they're asking me questions that they might be able to just Google or, you know, figure out and, and maybe, um, it's just not as productive of a, of a get together and call. So I, I want to say that if you are someone who's like rising up in your career and you want to find a mentor, that's great, but really like come to them with very specific questions because you've done a bit of the legwork. Otherwise, I think it's a it's a missed opportunity. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I hear you on that one. Uh, I, I, yeah, it, it do the legwork, and I think it's also important to have some clarity too in in terms of. And I know that's hard. And that's oftentimes why you're seeking help and advice, but. You know, it's it's always, for example, it's hard if someone comes and is like, oh, I'm looking for a new role. I'll do anything anywhere. And then it like, it's harder to, to help them when the, when it's, you know, yeah. the, the field is so wide versus having directions so you can kind of hit the ground running. Right. So if you, if you write an email to someone that you want advice from, rather than saying like, can I pick your brain? Maybe you bullet out like two or three very specific questions. So then that I can come also more prepared to the call. If that makes sense. It does. That's good advice. And finally, do you have a, a thought or a, a question, something, a final, final insight that you'd like to leave with our audience today? I love to tell people that when women make more, the world becomes a better place. And I say that not just because I, I think it sounds great. I think it's because for me too, I mean, as you're going through your financial, personal financial journey, um, it's really important to have a why behind why you make the choices that you make and why you're trying to get out of debt or get the raise or become an entrepreneur and have more financial freedom. The why is so important. And when I heard that when women who make more, the world becomes a better place. And what I mean by that is when you think about giving in this country, women, despite the fact that they make less than men and they have less in savings than men, they contribute more to society with their dollars as far as uh, charitable donations go and all that good stuff. They give they give more of as a percentage of their income away than any other group. So, you know, I thought of that and I thought, you know, me having a healthy financial life is important to me, yes, but it's also important for the world. And if you're somebody like me who likes to uh, make an impact and find reasons beyond themselves to do the right things, I think that's a really powerful message. It was definitely powerful for me to hear that. And so I want to pass that on to your listeners that when women make more, the world becomes a better place. So you living your life to the financial fullest is not just your to your benefit, it's to all of our benefits. Perfect way to end this conversation. Furnish, thank you for joining us on the Elevate podcast. It was a true pleasure to get to hang with you today and to learn from all of your insights and expertise. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for listening to Elevate. If you like what you hear, help a girl out. Subscribe to the Elevate podcast on iTunes. Give us five stars and share your review. Also, don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Elevate NTWK. That's Elevate Network. And become a member. You can learn all about membership and all the great things that Elevate Network is doing at our website, www.elevatenetwork.com that's e-l-l-e-v-a-t-e network.com and special thanks to our producer Catherine Heller she rocks and to our voiceover artist Rachel Griesinger thanks so much and join us next week 
In our Future of Cloud survey, Deloitte discovered two approaches to innovation. Those who look at the new technologies and changes swirling around them and wonder what's possible, and those who use cloud to engineer their possible. Generating new revenue, advancing processes, and sparking cultures of innovation. Learn more about what separates these cloud innovators. Download Closing the Cloud Strategy, Technology, and Innovation Gap at Deloitte.com slash US slash cloud survey.